Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is uh, Deborah Scally, and I am the editor of Corporate Board Member Magazine. And on behalf of Corporate Board Member and our parent company, the New York Stock Exchange, we'd like to welcome each of you here today to our Moving the Needle think tank on boardroom diversity. Uh, we're very excited to hold this think tank today, and um, uh, it complements our larger Moving the Needle dinner and networking program that we'll be having later this summer, July 18th and 19th, here at the Exchange as well. Uh, so we're very pleased to have, uh, have you here for this, and we're excited to talk about um, all of the issues surrounding boardroom diversity. We expect to have a very enlightening and engaging conversation, and uh, just happy to have everyone here participating. Uh, before we get started with the questions and with the topics, I want to talk a little bit about the format just briefly. Um, we will have two separate segments. One is examining the business case, does diversity drive corporate uh, performance? And our second segment is global trends and realities, do quotas and uh, mandates build better boards? So those will each be for an hour. We'll have a short break in between and um, our moderator will introduce each question at that point, everyone will have a chance to, uh, to comment on the question, and then with the available time, we'll allow a little bit of uh, follow-up and, and going back and forth. But we would ask that everybody be uh, somewhat mindful to the time constraints that we're under this morning, so try to perhaps keep your comments and remarks as succinct as possible. <clears throat> um, we are videotaping, as I mentioned. This will be uh, edited down for a very short highlights program tape that we'll be showing at our dinner. So um, first, I would like to introduce everyone here, just so that we have a good record of everyone that we're, that we're speaking with this morning. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome uh, PwC and Maria Motes. Uh, Maria is the Chief Diversity Officer for PwC, and PwC is a corporate sponsor of the Moving the Needle event and uh, the, the dinner and the think tank, and so we're very, very pleased to have their support and have you here today, you. Maria. And Maria will be serving as our moderator. We're also uh, very pleased to welcome uh, Charles King, Chuck King from uh, CT Partners, who is also a corporate sponsor of the event, and we're just extremely happy to have such good support from the uh, community and uh, um, very pleased to have you here today, Charles. Nice to be here, thank you. Uh, so our panelists, <coughs> First, we have uh, Caroline Apfel, and Caroline, I'll make this very brief so that we can sort of get on to the, uh, uh, to the topics, but Caroline is the chapter head for the Paris chapter of the Women Corporate Directors. Uh, next to her, we have Stephen Brown, who is the Senior Director of Corporate Governance and the Associate General Counsel for Advocacy and Oversight for TIAA CREF, and welcome, Stephen. Um, on our other side, we have Arnold Donald, who is, uh, f was formerly with the Executive Leadership Council, I think just stepped down as CEO, and uh, he brings a lot of good boardroom experience to our group. He is a director at Carnival Corp, Carnival PLC, Crown Holdings, Oil Dry Corp of America, and the Luck Lead Group. So um, that's going to bring a lot of good insight for us from the actual boardroom side. Yeah. Um, we also have Hillary Sale, who is an executive committee member for the uh, for Direct Women, and uh, Hillary brings a nice academic uh, side to our conversation. She is the Walter D. Coles Professor of Law and Professor of Management for Washington University School of Law in St. Louis. So welcome, Hillary. Thank you. And then we also have Ron Parker, who is here from the Executive Leadership Council, and. Uh, Ron is the incoming CEO, as I understand, and he um, is the retired Senior Vice President and Human Resources and Chief Diversity Officer for PepsiCo. Good. So we have a lot of great experience on this panel, and at this point, I will turn it over to Maria to start off with our first discussion. Thank you, Deborah. Mm -hmm. So as, as Deborah said, uh, we were, um, our first discussion topic will be, does board diversity drive corporate performance. And we were all asked to uh, read a variety of research um, that has been done over the past several years. And I would say from my read that uh, when you take a look at all of that, the outcomes uh, vary. And perhaps they're inconclusive. 
And so what I'd like for us to do first um, is focus on the question that says, if we start with a premise that says adding diverse candidates to public company boards is the objective, how critical, how critical to the success of that goal is proving the business case for diversity? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who would like to take that one? Okay, you look at <laughs> <laughs> um, So the question is, how critical is proving the business case exactly. of diversity for um, justification for um, ensuring that boards are diverse? Correct. Um, you know, my personal point of view is that uh, it is not critical to prove that diversity makes a difference because the evidence is all around us. Mm -hmm. And anyone that has organized a diverse, talented team of people focused on a common objective with a process to work together realize that that group realizes that that group will out-solution a homogeneous group 99 times out of 100. Mm -hmm. And it's evident in everything. It's evident in nature. It's evident in anything. We see that you know, diversity matters. And, and, and it, you know, the most critical thing for any corporation for sustained success is innovation. Exactly. Okay. You cannot sustain success without innovating. You have to change your internal processes. You change your products, your services. I mean, if you don't innovate over time, mm -hmm. you will fail. Innovation, by definition, is thinking outside the box. Yep. So diversity of thinking is what sustains innovation. Yep. Does diversity guarantee diversity of thinking? No. Do you have a higher probability of achieving diversity of thinking if you have a diverse group of people doing that thinking? Yes. So That's to okay. try to prove it empirically um, when you have so many variables uh, that enter into an individual's company's performance over a period of time, and the board primarily serves a governance role, okay? Uh, depending what level uh, you're talking about, they're small company boards and they may actually help the company operate. But very large corporations, the boards are primarily there for governance right. and for selection of key personnel. Mm -hmm. They don't operate the company and they shouldn't. That, that's mm -hmm. very helpful. Mm -hmm. do, do others want to uh, add? Yeah, I, I would agree with that, uh, given the fact that uh, Arnold and I are colleagues. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I would say, uh, to add to that, it's, it's about growth. Uh, those companies that are seeking growth uh, need to rely upon uh, innovation and, and different ways of, of achieving that growth uh, and sustaining that growth. And the only way you can do that is by not practicing practices of, of old. And that is to be bold enough uh, and courageous enough and engaging enough uh, supported by processes that will allow for uh, these uh, exchanges that are different than what have been discussed before. Otherwise, I think you're limiting your potential as, as an organization and I think you're limiting the potential of your most uh, valuable asset and that's your people. That's, uh, that's terrific. So, so what I hear is it may not be critical to prove the business case. Or diversity. Uh, Hillary, do you have something? And in fact, it might be impossible to prove mm -hmm. the business case for diversity. And I think it's really important to keep that in mind. So what we have out there is an increasing number of econometric studies, which are flawed always. Um, and they, they set out to prove whether having a diverse board affects various return on assets or return on investment, other pieces of how we measure corporate performance. Mm -hmm. They're inconclusive. They're inconclusive for lots of reasons, including that the methodology doesn't ever prove causation. I, I hate to be overly academic, but it only proves correlation um, when it works. And most of these studies are short-run focused. We don't have long-run studies for good reason. We don't have long-run diverse mm -hmm. boards, so we couldn't measure it if we tried. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but I do think that the other field of academic research that comes out of the organizational behavior area is actually quite strong about diverse teams and how diverse teams operate and how out of that we get better innovation and innovation leads to growth. Will we be able actually to measure that? I don't think so, partly because you don't know whether a company that chose a diverse board was more innovative to begin with. Exactly. Yeah. You can't ever hold it constant. So it's very hard to tell, but it doesn't mean that there isn't value in diversity. Absolutely. 
Yeah, that's terrific. Stephen, do you? Sure, I, I think I'm going to echo of what has already been said, uh, but let me just give a, a plug uh, simply for research, because over uh, for over 90 years, TI Craft has helped academics and researchers uh, with lifetime security and retirement. So we are always pro jobs for academics and researchers and, and to keep them employed and to keep them <laughs> thinking about issues. That said, the business case has already been made. Exactly. Uh, if we look back uh, at uh, one, of, one of the seminal cases in, uh, uh, recently in diversity, the University of Michigan Law School case, which uh, I had the pleasure uh, in, when I was in private practice working on. Um, and what we saw in that case was the business community. Uh, we, had, we saw many friends of the court briefs, amicus briefs. Uh, several were submitted by the business community, the Fortune 500, who overwhelmingly told the court um, that diversity matters deeply. Mm -hmm. They know that throughout their employee base. They, they, they believe that throughout their management base. Um, the same with uh, their board of director base. Uh, and so they made that case. Uh, and so there's a tremendous amount of, uh, if, you, if you will, ac uh, anecdotal mm -hmm. evidence. Um, and when you go to uh, leaders in the business community, uh, and I don't think it's just uh, paying lip service. Lip, it's not lip service. They, you know, they've experienced it. They, they know what it means. They care so deeply about it that they went on the record in, in, in the seminal case before the Supreme Court many years ago. Uh, so I think the case has been made. No, that's, that's terrific. So the case has been made. Now let's talk about the pace of change. <laughs> let's talk about the pace of change. So it, it, is, it appears slow, right? And so what is, what is behind that? And specifically, I want to ask a couple questions. Does, do we think that the board recruitment process is broken? And if so, where should boards go looking for talent? Mm -hmm. So is it broken? And if so, where's the talent? Mm -hmm. Who would like to take that one? Let me start with that yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck, you I've, that been, one? I've been recruiting directors now for 18 years. Um, and I don't think the process is broken. Having said that, I don't think the process has made a lot of progress over the years. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the focus on diversity 18 years ago when I got into this business was, uh, uh, was really focused solely on finding somebody, a person of color, a woman, to serve on a board because, quite candidly, it looked really good in the annual, annual report. report. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was exactly the wrong reason to be doing this. Mm -hmm. And so what happened in those, you know, in those early days of, of good governance, if you will, was that you saw, uh, you saw some people serving on seven, eight, mm -hmm. 10, 11 boards. Mm -hmm. And you have to begin to question how much can they, how much can they contribute uh, you know, when they're uh, you know, in a different city every week attending a different company's board meeting. There has been a, a great evolution over the years in terms of the, the entire diversity movement in boardrooms. And I think boards are now, number one, doing it for all the right reasons, because diversity does matter in the boardroom. Mm -hmm. Diversity really does, uh, you know, anecdotal, empirical, mm -hmm. uh, statistical, uh, what, whatever approach you want to take, it really does make a difference. Mm -hmm. Take your classic consumer products company. Mm -hmm. You look at, the, uh, look at the customer base, mm -hmm. and 15 years ago, the board looked nothing like the customer base of that company. <laughs> and yet you had, and I, I feel privileged to be part of this group, uh, being the only sort of non-diverse <laughs> member of this panel. Well, it makes you the well, <laughs> You are diverse. We'll you, so we were saying. We'll give you an honorary card. I don't, yeah. okay, imagine I'm, if the boards looked like yeah, me. And, ima and uh, 20 years ago, the boards looked like me. They were a bunch of 60-year-old white guys. <laughs> Um, but it, it's, it's changed. I think boards are certainly a lot more sensitive to the, the real benefit of diversity. And more importantly, and a point that I, I wanted to make, I have always said that the best bargain in corporate America is a, is a good corporate board. Mm -hmm. You can bring talent into that boardroom and surround that CEO with talent that you couldn't afford to buy on the open market. Mm -hmm. And you're getting these people at, at bargain basement rates. Mm -hmm. And you're getting great, you know, great thought processes, processes in the boardroom, and great contributions. Boards have finally come around to the to the recognition that they need to build 
a board using a portfolio approach. Hmm. They need a mix <coughs> of, of skills. Diversity is not just about color or gender. Diversity is also about skill sets. Mm -hmm. When I first got into this business, all people wanted on boards were other sitting CEOs. Mm -hmm. And you know, that doesn't make for the best board. Mm -hmm. You have seven people sitting around a table who are all too busy to be worried about somebody else's problems because mm -hmm. they have their own, mm -hmm. right. quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And they were serving on four and five outside boards back in those days. Mm -hmm. So there just wasn't the time. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, the process is not broken. I think boards have, have come around to realizing that they need to, uh, they need to diversify. Uh, if there is a shortcoming, it's that there is still a perception that there's not enough talent out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, well, I would say, about, Maria, the, the, you, said, you asked the question about the pace of change. The pace of change. The pace of change and why has it been slower than I think right. some of us would have liked. What's getting in the way? I, I think there's been uh, the whole mysticism around boards and the compositions of boards is just now being opened up. And the transparency that is being driven by um, both legislation and I think also by uh, shareholders, uh, proxies, are creating this transparency that allows for now questions to be asked, are we really serving the best interests of the enterprise by having a composition of board members who are basically of the same cloth? There's also this issue of a business model that was built around speed. If I have members of my board whom I have a relationship with, and I know basically how they're going to respond to issues, then my ability as a CEO to move quickly you know, is enhanced. Mm -hmm. Now you uh, have uh, thrown in the question of this whole issue about the diversity of the board, people that I may have an acquaintance of, but not maybe a deep relationship with, expands the discussion, but in doing so, the outcome is much richer. So the pace of change is, I think, just a uh, dynamic of where we are in that continuum of how transparent boards have now become versus where they, where they were, say, 10, 15 years ago. That's helpful, I, right? Yeah, I'd like to add, a, if I may, a non-American perspective. Sure. First, because your question, in your question, there is, uh, the answer is inherent in the question in the sense <laughs> that you're assuming that there is a process. <laughs> but let me tell you, back in France, this, right. you know, the, and, and you, can, you can talk about this, um, you still find companies who just don't have a nominating committee. They don't have a process. So basically, the way it was done up until fairly recently, is you went out and basically selected the peers and the people you felt comfortable having around you in a board discussion. So, you know, you're assuming there is a process when in a number of countries, in a number of regions of the world, you know, you, everything is relative. You're, you're, you know, sitting in America with good corporate governance, uh, there's a lot that's been done and you're finding the process to be really slow. Well, let me tell you, <laughs> on the other side of the pond, you know, we're looking at what's happening in corporate America, we're looking at what's happening in the UK and saying, whoa, it's amazing. So there's a wave, uh, and, and for us it's, you know, and we'll talk about the numbers on the second part sure. of, the, uh, right. of our conversation, but it's just amazingly quick what's happened, if you just take the example of France, compared to where you guys are sitting from uh, in corporate America. That's See, helpful. I think the process is broken, and uh, I think it is, is an obstacle, um, uh, the process in the United States. Mm. Uh, because the process uh, is one of, uh, for the Fortune 500, mm -hmm. let's say. So the process difference of it's Fortune 500 if it's mid-cap, small-cap, et cetera. But for a Fortune 500, uh, the process often is still who knows whom and is still primarily looking for sitting CEO mm -hmm. or other similar ilk. And uh, a recent example of an individual who became uh, CEO of a you know, Fortune 1000 company, uh, she was instantly bombarded yeah, my calls. with opportunities to go on the board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, two weeks before, and she wasn't even the CEO yet, she was going to be CEO and then six months later mm -hmm. made CEO. Well, two weeks before that, she's the same person. Mm -hmm. That's right. 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 Her competencies are the same. Mm -hmm. Her skills, her capabilities are all the same. But she wasn't being offered to go on boards because she didn't meet a screen. And these arbitrary screens 
do get in the way. They do. And the familiarity, familiarity and acquaintance issue gets in the way. Mm -hmm. So diversity requires proactive intervention. Mm -hmm. Whether it's diversity of skill and demographic or, you know, we're going to be different and we're going to put someone who's head of a human resources organization for a large corporation on our board. We're going to be different because mm -hmm. most people won't do, most corporations right. don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, we're also going to be different because we're going to proact and we're going to find the up and comers who are really capable now of providing, you know, skills and competency. And that's extra work. Mm -hmm. It's harder to find those people because they haven't met the automatic screens. Mm -hmm. All right. so, and, so that's very helpful. Yeah. So let's stay with that. Because I also had part of my question was, where is the talent? Yeah. Where's what? I'm sorry. Where's, Where's the, talent? the talent? Well, Where's we're producing 20-something women a year with direct women who are all talented, pre-screened, okay. potential public company board members. And we're just one organization. Right. All of our women are trained problem solvers. All of them have managerial experience. Good job. All of them are leaders. Mm -hmm. They're diverse within our diversity of being women. Mm -hmm. And we have a great pool mm -hmm. every single year that we put out there. Mm -hmm. That's Same important. thing with the EOC. Yeah. EOC is an organization that uh, uh, Arnold has been a part of, as myself and uh, others. Uh, that we have a pool of, of African American executives who have been trained in fiduciary responsibilities and have been actually certified mm -hmm. uh, around certain parts of board governance that are ready and able and willing. Um, but you just, if I could just backtrack to your earlier question, I think also metrics have been an issue around why things haven't also changed because the metric by which search firms are rewarded is speed and familiarity. So if you say, if you change the metric, I think you start to change the process mm -hmm. by which mm -hmm. search committees and search partners, because I've been in bo on both sides, both in the private sector side and the uh, uh, external search side, if you change the metric, you change the behavior. Absolutely. And those metrics still have to be adjusted in order to do what Hillary is doing mm -hmm. and what Arnold has been now leading us uh, through ELC. Mm -hmm. and I know you want to talk about numbers later, but the reality is since 2004, the number of African Americans, women, Asians, and um, Hispanics on Fortune 500 boards is flattish. Mm -hmm. It's flat. Right. Since 2004, the number of African Americans on Fortune 500 boards has declined. declined. Yeah and everybody was underrepresented <clears throat> to begin with, so it's even more underrepresentation. So clearly something's broken. Mm. It, it, Steve, where's the talent? Um, you know, if great talent knocked on your door every day, then Chuck, Ron would be, would be out of a job. Uh, <laughs> um, great talent, uh, you have to look and work hard. And if I can use the very crude analogy of, of, uh, of, which, uh, of sports, and you look at college sports mm -hmm. um, and the amount of time that coaches and assistant coaches spend on the road looking for talent right. uh, so they can have a winning team um, is tremendous. And for a long time, let's say in basketball, uh, they would n never look overseas. Uh, and then there was a couple coaches mm -hmm. that went and grabbed mm -hmm. uh, a, a couple of uh, Eastern European uh, youngsters uh, to come to college. Mm -hmm. And then there was great success. Then others looked, and they went across seas. So now, going across seas to find talent, even at the amateur level, um, is a common practice. Mm -hmm. We saw that in college football with breaking the race barrier. Mm -hmm. um, it took a while, but once folks got comfortable and saw talent, uh, they invested the time to go look. And, it, and these folks don't knock on your door. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you have to invest the time to really, really put in the effort to go search mm. uh, and make sure that you have, if you're using an outside advisor, that they have uh, not simply their standard Rolodex, mm. but they're going to look deeply to find talent, which may not be simply in the C-suite. Because as an investor, um, we certainly, and we invest in 8,000 companies across the globe. Uh, we care very deeply about corporate governance. We care very deeply about looking at boards uh, and many different aspects of corporate governance. Um, having CEOs on your board is okay, but that's a, that's a thing that's sort of fading away because CEOs are busy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so important that you have industry expertise, which you can find 
by division presidents, uh, line, uh, senior line managers um, who can come in and do the job. It's also a great development, development tool for them in their own corporations. So many corporations push that. It's just that you have to look harder to find those folks. See, but that, but the argument kind of, that says that you know the talent is hard to find or doesn't exist doesn't is exist. BS. I mean, you know, we all exactly. know it. Call it, the, what, call it what it is. Call it what it is. It's, it's, a, it's a very French <laughs> word. <laughs> so you know, and we've heard that for a number of years. And so every time you show, so all these initiatives between women corporate directors, between the the effort that search firms have made about proactively creating talent pools. Every time you sort of scratch the surface, you do fine. So it's not that complicated. And I think that argument is just stale and long gone. So, you know, of course, we're all preaching amongst ourselves and we're all <laughs> convinced. But, uh, but, you know, once you, going back to the studies and everything that was done, it's the first time, and that's why I was interested in reading the material, it's actually the first time that I've heard that there is either um, inconclusive evidence or that there's contrary evidence to the fact that diversity is just good corporate uh, uh, behavior. So, um, you know, without wanting to go back to the, uh, to the actual uh, academic uh, uh, studies and everything, I think not just all of us, but I think, you know, corporate, uh, whether it's corporate America or even European uh, corporate setups, I think people understand that there is, that it is fundamental uh, as a progress moving forward to initiate, to uh, not just initiate, but make sure that that diversity does exist because it just makes sense. I mean, At the end of the day, Carolyn, I mean, you're absolutely right. Yeah. But I think we tr fall into a trap. We get seduced and when the question is asked, well, what's the uh, empirical evidence that says that this matters? Mm -hmm. We then rush into a room and try to grab as much evidence right. as we can. But how often do we how ask often do that we question? do that when we say there are emerging markets uh, in <clears> Eastern <throat> Europe That's or right. in Asia? Yeah. How many times do you ask the marketing people to go back and prove <laughs> the business case? That's exactly right. Or going beyond yeah. right. the U.S. borders mm -hmm. for an opportunity of just waiting to be. At the end of the day, it's about leadership, and if leadership doesn't come from the C-suite and from the office of the CEO, along with the uh, head of the board nominating. nominating committee, then you can put all the evidence in front of people, That's you right. can put all the processes in front of people. At the end of the day, it takes courageous leadership mm. to venture into this area and to consistently ask for things that have normally been ignored or pacified in the past. And aren't, I, we, I going, do, aren't we going down the wrong path? Aren't we giving an audience the stick that we can be beaten up with <laughs> by asking for evidence. Exactly. I mean, you know, earning that's numbers. right. It's, it's a just, red herring. It's, it's a red herring. It's a red so, herring. So, you know, why are we even, right. you know, why are we even <laughs> belaboring again, the point? Again, <laughs> I want to say from the investor standpoint, the case has already been made, at least in the United States, in terms of that's right. we have a deep appreciation now of what it means for independent directors mm. with the basic thought that. We want folks, in the, we want the super majority of people in that boardroom who don't work for the company, have no relationship with the company, have no uh, related transactions of significant amounts, because we believe that uh, independent thought is important. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and not, not that folks who run the company are important to leadership. They are absolutely cr critical. But the case for independence and, if you will, th that diversity of, of, of thought vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, those who are running the day-to-day -day operation of the company, uh, it's the case that has been made in the United States for quite a long time. Um, and there is no case that I've been able to look at academically uh, that is sort of pro-homogeneity uh, having the <laughs> club uh, in point. terms of, of making, uh, I haven't seen that case, that, that affirmative case made, because um, that's not talked about. Uh, but we do stick on, well, we need more evidence to figure out if diversity matters or not. I think, um, again, it's something, um, we're pro-research and pro-folks looking at things. Uh, there perhaps are other things that they could, they could look at uh, that would be more uh, of social value because I think the case has been made very strongly. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. I heard themes around leadership, mm -hmm. changing behaviors, mm -hmm. if we need to change metrics to, to do that so that we can drive different behaviors. That's very helpful. I want to talk about, um, speaking of people wanting to change the pace, <laughs> right? Um, Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg has been a real proponent for women in leadership, as many of us know. Um, however, when you look at 
the board for Facebook. They have, I think, all white men on the board. And recently there was a grassroots campaign, I believe it was called Face It, that tried to pressure right, Facebook to appoint a female director to their board. And they got thousands of signatures. So my question is, do you believe that such a grassroots campaign and effort is effective to drive change? Who would like to take that? Chuck. <laughs> I mean, we're both, you know, we're, so I think it certainly can be. <laughs> they should have named themselves Occupy Face. <laughs> But it can be powerful, right? I mean, I, mean, I think you look at Facebook and IPOs are kind of a unique mm -hmm. circumstance because you tend to have a lot of the venture capitalists and other people involved in the startup on the board. And by and large, the venture capital zone has also been um, one of the last bastions um, of diversity or non-diversity. So I, I think you see, you know, whether Facebook would make some changes down the road. I hate to pick on them because they've had a rough start. But, <laughs> <laughs> but whether they'll make changes down the road, I think, is a fair question. And I think that depends on how strong that particular Facebook movement is, right? That is separate from grassroots movements we've seen elsewhere, which have created change and put um, and are putting increasing pressure on the United States, I think. See, I don't know if you're calling, you know, if, if associations like WCD, Women Corporate Directors, is grassroots or not, but it's a very different approach. It's saying, you know, there is a, a way to rally uh, the women, and not just the women, but the, uh, the constituencies around um, board uh, good governance measures to say, you know, the women do exist, and here they are, and, you know, they are trained, and if they're not trained, we do train them. Um, and taking that message uh, outside of the U.S., because, again, my point is everything being relative uh, from, you know, where we're sitting in the U.S., it's, uh, it's amazing what's been done here. So exporting that message, again, is it grassroots or not, but, you know, doing it from an association point of view, doing it from a training perspective, doing it from, we're going to talk about quotas later, but, you know. Yeah, Maria, I, th I think that's, that is a slow drumbeat to what I think we all would like to see yeah. when it stems from the grassroots efforts. And, and, and here's my reason why. Being in the private sector, the way the private sector responds to grassroots efforts is that it finds what is the minimum requirement mm. yeah. that I need to respond to. And once they kind of put the uh, line just a little bit above that and they know what the minimum requirement would be, would be they respond to that. And this is where I get back to leadership. It has to also be a dynamic tension from grassroots efforts, but also from the top and somewhere you meet in the middle. Because, again, being in senior positions in the C-suite, you are tasked with how do you protect your iconic brand from these outside forces that are foreign that you may not understand what not the intentions are. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that I was asked to do while at PepsiCo was to respond to some institutional investors, the Calvert Group, around what are our diversity efforts, both domestically and offshore. Mm -hmm. Strategic planning people, investor uh, relations people thought, scratching their heads, saying, why are they asking you? Mm -hmm. Well, immediately was kind of informed by the legal team, go out and find out what they want. <laughs> That's a loaded question. What <laughs> right, do they want? Right. No. The question should be, is what should we and how should we respond? Yeah. Is this just a, this is a trend that's going to be a reoccurring trend? And how might we pro be proactive and how might we use this particular topic as a competitive advantage versus our competition? Mm. So it's the whole mindset piece right. of how you look at it. But once it's only from a grassroots piece, Again, that threshold is established and we respond to just that. And I, and I can helpful. actually comment that uh, Pepsi has certainly evolved in that space in terms of how it relates to investors, because we certainly are a large holder at TIA Craft uh, and, and have regular dialogues on uh, plenty of corporate governance issues with Pepsi. Uh, on Facebook, I just want to say, A, um, it seems pretty simple to do diversity at Facebook, which would be simply be someone who's going to dress up for a board meeting mm -hmm. um, and not, not wear a hoodie. <laughs> um, if you think about uh, having a, a very broad concept of diversity, um, it, um, I, I wanted to speak to the simple point of uh, particularly a startup company or a company who's in a growth phase uh, and the importance of uh, being able to launch a company 
uh, appropriately um, and drive growth uh, is, uh, is extremely important. Similarly, issues around how you build your board and what you reflect back to the millions of customers that you have are equally as important. So we are, uh, to, we are a shareholder now of Facebook, and uh, were we to have a conversation, uh, the list would uh, include several things, including board composition, uh, including board structure and the governance. So there's a lot of things that uh, right. would be on that list. <laughs> which, uh, and, but my point there is that uh, at the end of the day, you know, our job is to create long-term shareholder value for the people who invest in mm. us. Um, and so when we go into these conversations, whether it's Pepsi or Facebook or what mm. have you, uh, we have a very clear list of the issues, which may include uh, board composition, mm -hmm. uh, if we think it's an issue, uh, and several other strategic issues, another uh, cor uh, corporate governance competencies. But we, we, once we decide that those are the three issues or the five issues, we do treat them equally. And we, and we want to spend time on each one to, from our leadership position as a corporate governance, um, people who care about corporate governance as long-term investors, that these things matter. And so uh, and we're, there's nothing grassroots about TIA Craft as a you know, $500 billion asset manager. Uh, but what we do respect out of any grassroots movement is the ability to speak to the board mm -hmm. and let them hear you as an investor of what you think and, and, and get their, Ron, get mm -hmm. their reaction. And, and see how they think through the issues. Mm -hmm. But in, yeah. in reality, TIAA Craft has done a marvelous job of putting their opinions forward and their recommendations. CalPERS, CalSTRS, all the big pension funds, all the institutional investors have been doing this. CalPERS may have been the, the father of the mo modern governance movement 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, the fact is we haven't made any progress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So whether it's pure grassroots or whether it's Folks like TIA, CREF, CalPERS, some of the big pension funds who really have some, uh, have some authority behind them, mm -hmm. it still hasn't been effective enough mm -hmm. if we look at the numbers. Mm -hmm. And I would say the, um, back to the, just the grassroots aspect, is, it's like softening the beachhead. So, you know, grassroots is helpful. It's not determinant, yeah. right? mm -hmm. but it is helpful. And uh, it, it brings attention to an issue. It has people think about it, reflect on it, discuss it, debate it, and, and that helps a lot. Uh, the prime directive of any publicly traded company is to maximize return to shareholders over the life of the firm. If you're management, you assume the life of the firm is in perpetuity, okay? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a good way to think. <laughs> and, um, and the reality is one of the key aspects of the over time maximized return is freedom to operate. Mm -hmm. And grassroots is an, is an early indicator mm -hmm. of future freedom to operate. Mm -hmm. And that's why it does matter, and mm -hmm. people pay attention. Is it determinant? No. Mm -hmm. Does it soften the beachhead? Is it helpful? Yes. So, it's just um, part. It's just part. That's part. what I was going to say. It's just a part. It's a beginning, right. in some ways, of renewed focus on this issue, which is so important. But we don't get there without... Um, I, I think people with moving the needle and corporate board member have been using the term mentorship. I would use the term sponsorship because sure. I think it's exactly. decidedly different and it is Advocate. what makes the difference. When Arnold Donald says, I want to put this woman on a board or I want to put this African American on a board, that's how it happens. How it happens. Mm -hmm. You have to take them one by one and place them on boards. And that's what makes the difference. Mm -hmm. It's that actual sponsorship, somebody looking out for each individual and getting them over the hurdle and into the boardroom. Mm -hmm. I don't have any doubt that every woman I have in the Direct Women Institute can prove her case. Mm -hmm. I don't have any doubt that every single one of them will mm -hmm. be a valuable board member. Indeed, the ones that are on public company boards have been fabulous, and we hear great things about them. How do they get there? Someone takes sure, them into takes the boardroom, right? Somebody calls the headhunter and says, this is the person for that search. You called me. You don't want me. You want this person right. over here. Take this person. Right. And that's, a big, that's the biggest piece. Yeah, that's very helpful. So, um, so, how do, so I was going to say. No, go ahead. You go ahead. How do you all feel then about the law as an accelerator of quotas? <laughs> <laughs> we, we can go there. We can no, maybe, go. maybe you wanted to, to do that. Well, you know, we are going to talk about it in the next session. What I wanted okay. to do is um, give us all an opportunity, and Hillary, you started, by we've been talking about pace of change and yeah. that it's slow. That's why I wanted to. What can get in the way? 
and the behaviors and the like. But I wanted to give us an opportunity before we close off this session to give any other ideas and thoughts that you might have had by reading this over the weekend and preparing for this session to say, what can be done? What should people be doing? And you introduced, Hillary, the concept of sponsorship and advocacy for others that may not be part of their familiar network. Mm -hmm. right. So anyone else would like to have some well, closing remarks and thoughts? Well, I, I think, again, if this is a process, it should be uh, reviewed and studied, uh, and some deliberate action needs to be a part of it. Um, again, if it is a process that needs to be addressed, and it does, there are other ways of inching away at the status quo. For example, um, advisory boards. We say that the whole board, fiduciary board response uh, area is about relationships. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you then create opportunities for relationships to be formed? In some cases, in the cases I experienced at PepsiCo, we experienced, we uh, experimented with an external advisory board mm -hmm. that was made up of women and people of color. And by doing so, it enlightened management to the talent mm -hmm. and the capabilities and the sources and the pools of organizations that exist out there, both here in the United States and abroad, of groups that were below the C-suite or the CEO's radar screen. And by bringing that as a part, as an adjunct to our fiduciary responsibility, it was a great way to say, wow, I didn't realize Maria you know, has been around the world and she has all of these, where has she been? Mm -hmm. and, you know, you chuckle because if you know Maria, Maria has been all the time. It's just that <laughs> your circle in which, in which you fly mm -hmm. doesn't encompass where she flies. And so you start to have some overlapping exposure to talent that exists out there around the world that gives that a courageous leader an opportunity to say, <clears throat> I know Maria. I've seen her in action. I've seen that she is well ground, uh, grounded in governance. And I think she'll be someone we should put on the slate. And I've seen CEOs actually suggest the search firms people that they have encountered, whether it's at our EOC dinner, Arnold, mm -hmm. or other venues that we all have to create a critical mass of talented women and people of color, uh, where in some cases you have some senior leaders saying, wow, I've never encountered this before. Mm -hmm. This is fantastic. And it's been in existence for 25 years. <laughs> We're celebrating our silver anniversary. And you're telling me that you're, you're only knowing about this organization and, and what its intents, uh, intentions are you know, for the first time? And we're celebrating 25 years? So those are some of the things that I think we could, we as practitioners, as advocates, can do to start to expose the talent to circles that sometimes are very tight because of the time of constraints. That's terrific. Any other thoughts around this? Yeah. Uh, well, let, let me just state the obvious that uh, I think we, uh, we all uh, acknowledge that uh, finding board members and getting the right board member uh, is not an easy process. Right? Um, when you uh, elect a board member, I mean, you're married to him or her. Um, uh, if you don't, it, 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 maybe you have uh, age limits um, that eventually when they hit their age, you can get them off. But it's very difficult to move them out. Uh, by the way, if you do, just ask us uh, as investors. We could help you with that. Uh, but it's very difficult. So when you, when, you, when you get someone on a board, it's very difficult uh, uh, if they're not working out to, to remove them. So we understand that the process needs to be extraordinary due diligence, um, that having trust and respecting their judgment is, uh, uh, is an important thing. That said, um, I think it's important to acknowledge that the process is tough, and also sometimes having the discussion about diversity inside the boardroom can be a tough thing because people, yes. particularly in the United States, have a difficult time having that conversation. And the first thing we have to do is, is make that conversation not difficult. Mm -hmm. um, it's such an important conversation that we can't beat around the bush. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't have folks who've been in the boardroom for hundreds of years uh, feel that they need to protect their turf mm -hmm. uh, because it's not their turf, it's <laughs> my turf and the people who invest <laughs> in TIA Craft. Uh, so we always have to remind them of that. But if we, if we sort of let down, just let down that guard of being able to have that conversation, and then when you're talking to your search consultant to say, this is what we're looking for, 
and understand that your circles may not be the circles that Maria is running in. That's why you haven't, you haven't figured out what ELC is, Executive Leadership Council, um, because you've had no one uh, in your circle who's been a part of it. But once you figure it out, uh, I'm sure uh, mm -hmm. you guys will say, you know, folks uh, keep coming back. Keep coming back, right. exactly. There's so we have to make it a, a less difficult conversation. Um, I just wanted to interject. I, I wanted to see if Arnold could speak to that point about opening that conversation in the boardroom, because I think that is a really, really great point. So I'll speak to that point, and if it's okay, I'll, I'll build on the other points, too. I think that, um, as Steve pointed out, you know, it's a process. And so it is important, it's critically important, the makeup of the board. Uh, so that there is active dialogue and a feeling of collaboration, but also a sense of mutual trust where individuals can speak their mind openly, because that's what it's all about. And so it, it is a very careful process. Uh, and so with that in mind, being on boards, I, I think you have to identify the sensitivities and then address them, not, not give in to them, but address them. So a simple thing. I was at a corporate um, board uh, director's training conference on governance. A question came up, not by anybody there, but one of the um, presenters. The question was, how important is diversity when you look at the next board member for your particular board? 80-something mm -hmm. companies represented. Only 19% said it was important. When the question, follow-on question, everybody was shocked. Absolutely. Uh, the presenter was shocked. <laughs> and they asked a lot of other questions. And, and you know, I tried to speak, but there was an African-American woman there, and she beat me to the punch. And so she, <laughs> she spoke first. And, um, and, and the guy you know, shook his finger and shook his head. He said, look, before you say anything, the most important thing is competency. I'm not going to compromise that for diversity. That's right. And the presenter said, where did you see that that was a trade-off yeah. trade question? <laughs> right. And question so, didn't ask mm -hmm. that. That's uh -huh. So the reality <laughs> is language is a powerful oh, that's thing. That's right. That's right. I hear diversity and inclusion. I think of level playing field and opportunity for everyone. Someone else hears that, and they hear competency. They hear or instead or of competency. competency. Okay. That's what they right. hear. I hear social justice and equity. I think, again, you know, fair opportunity for everyone, level playing field. They hear entitlement. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Given to those who don't deserve. Mm -hmm. And so something that simple, you, you have to be aware of those sensitivities. You have to be aware of each individual member on the board sensitivity so you can speak into it. And then you have to identify the right champions. You may not, I may not be on the boards. I'm on the best champion for diversity because they're already listening mm -hmm may be such that they couldn't hear me. Mm -hmm. And I may need to find someone else on that board right. you know, who could be heard and enroll them and say, this is what's good for our company and for our shareholders, and, and have them. So, so that's the, the, the dance that's there. But it's, it's not any different than any other dance in terms of operating a business or dealing right. with issues, whether it's you know, profits, et cetera. I mean, it's just all the same thing. This particular case happens to be diversity, OK? And to me, diversity ultimately equals profit. So, so that's that part. And I just wanted to add one other comment sure, go ahead. On, on, on the overall thing. You know, what ELC has embarked on, we've aligned around an objective of a net increase of at least 200 board seats held by African Americans over the next five years in publicly traded companies, not necessarily, not necessarily Fortune 500. And one of the things we do, we have a corporate board initiative, which is a, a cohort group of 23 individuals that have been screened by an executive search firm you know, for board readiness. We're preparing them, et cetera. We're going to find sponsors. The key thing is finding the sponsors. We hope we can get their CEOs to sponsor them to go on boards, mm -hmm. OK? So we can actually aggressively pursue that. But beyond that, we have lots of, a lot of our members are already on boards, mm -hmm. OK? Mm -hmm. So really, we're hoping to get others who aren't even members of ELC. Right. We have about 400 <clears> members. <throat> They're all CEOs of one or two levels below or have been. And uh, we're hoping to get, 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 get others through that. But another key aspect of this is the executive search firms. Mm -hmm. And what we're hoping to do is to enroll those executive search firms to say, we are going to alter our processes. We're going to become very aggressive in making certain we find, we mine the field, and we identify those qualified individuals who may but not fit the traditional screens. And we are going to present them forcefully mm -hmm. along with you know, the other candidates, so that at least we've done our part 
a given a company an opportunity to think differently. So we're hoping to enroll executive search firms in that. And then we're hoping to enroll a number of CEOs and um, uh, leading directors for corporations and nominating chairs uh, who will, who are already bought in, they are already practicing to enroll one or two of their colleagues mm -hmm. in the thought process. And all of the CEOs that serve on boards mm -hmm. are trying to encourage them. And so th those are specific actions, but, but I can't understate the, or the overstate the importance of sponsorship. Mm -hmm. you, if you have a powerful, influential person sponsoring a qualified individual, that makes all the difference in the world. That's right. I'd like, I'd like Last to word to... Uh, yeah. Just because, yeah. um, you know, the, the, the responsibility doesn't just lie on the search firms, as, as, right. as you would know. So it's a shared responsibility. And what I don't get, going back to your point, is, you know, you have a number of mandates. They are dictated by governance. So, you know, you have the age limits, you have the number of mandates, you have the tenure of the mandates. There's a mathematical equation that tells you how often and when you're going to have to be ready and prepared. So what I just don't get, and you know, you're dishing it out with all due respect, maybe to the search <laughs> firms, no, no, but no, it's no, a it's shared not. responsibility of saying, you know, how do we mutually, all actors and everybody involved in this process, on a continuous basis, make sure, going back to the talent issue, that the talent does exist and the mm -hmm. pipeline does exist. So going back to your earlier question about, you know, how do we do things, it's not, the process might be broken, it's not ideal, but it's not about thinking sequentially about things. It's doing all of the and above, all totally in parallel, agree. and doing it on a continuous basis. It's a virtuous circle, and uh, again, there's no guarantee, but um, mm -hmm. I don't know another solution. I don't see But I think, just to build on that, if I may, because I think what you're framing up mm -hmm. is we have to think about unique strategic alliances. <clears throat> of course that involves all of us who mm -hmm. are advocates of this particular change yeah. inside of corporate America. What and about what about non-advocates? You know, have we, you know, here we are again going back to the point of I think we're all convinced mm -hmm. and you know, we're all saying the same thing, but it would have been interesting in this panel to get somebody who politically, you know, it's not exactly very politically correct, but get somebody who might not be convinced or somebody who's actually written the research that shows either contrary evidence on, you know, is, is this, just to get, because I think this is, this is not just an alliance mm -hmm. among people who think alike, going back to the diversity mm -hmm. issue, it's getting people on board who are not convinced. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think that's going to be much more challenging, and they do exist, they don't necessarily want to stick their heads out and say, I'm not convinced, <laughs> but we all know them. Yeah. And Although we've the met not them. convinced people maybe fall more into this category that Arnold was talking about, which is when they hear diversity, mm -hmm. they hear that word, they That's hear right. competency, That's right. right? It's not about, they don't think, I mean, diversity is one of those terms, we use it a lot. Many of us have been to diversity training. <laughs> Many of us didn't <laughs> love diversity training, right? This is about something different. But, you know, you get a word like diversity that gets used a lot and people develop a lot of associations definition. with it mm -hmm. that are not necessarily, right. we have a great pool of talented, competent, mm -hmm. and diverse mm -hmm. candidates. So I do think some of it is just about that, right? The disconnect the between the when we all make our case and what people actually hear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine, though I would love to see them come be taped, I cannot imagine the person who would say diversity is bad in the boardroom, right? That I just can't imagine it. I think it has much more to Go do to with France. what Arnold said. <laughs> well, I know. I heard Come they're going to put France. pretty women on the boards in France. I read about Boy, that. It's gotten a lot of. Uh, uh, so, so I think with that, um, we'll conclude this part of the conversation. We'll take a short break and then we'll pick up where you left us off. That's okay. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Excellent.